about the musicality of them, of what makes them different, and what makes them the same. And then we'll sort of walk through different, when it's my wife who's uh, here, the, the harp is, we'll actually play some part of the harp, and you can then see what the differences are, and we'll describe how mechanically we change the pitch. The big problem with a harp, in a way, is that it's a wooden frame, but it, on a concert harp, this fella behind me here has to hold 1.12 tons of string tension, and and the little one here be cut half a ton. So on a piano, you've got an iron frame to take all that load, but on a harp, you've got only wood, so it has to be made really efficiently with the best of as possible. So I'll just introduce the two types of harp. The one on my right is a concert harp, and the one on my left is a folk harp, by definition. I'll stand up and move the chair, and you'll get an idea of the size of the men. Sometimes the harp on my right is called a pedal harp, and that's because you change the key by pressing a pedal. So you have to imagine that the strings on a harp are just like the white notes of a piano. And we'll start at that point, and then we'll carry on. Okay? I'm assuming you can hear me okay. So here we have a harp, a concert harp, with 46 strings on, um, and the strings are made from gut and wire and nylon, depending on where you are in the register of your strings. The actual sound is emitted from the sound box, which is a hollow shell here, and that amplifies the sound just as it would on the guitar, for instance. So the speak, I'll press a string here. Now the string I'm pulling here is a C, uh, and the C is red on a harp, and the F is black on a harp. And I always tell kids the C is red because Moses crossed the Red Sea, and they all say, "Who was Moses?" But that's the time we're in. So basically, you get a C scale by playing the C string. <laughs> But when you want a black note, you have to press the pedals at the bottom. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail when we are set here. So that's a concert harp. You can play in any key on a concert harp, which makes it a very versatile uh, and very heavy and quite a costly instrument. But nevertheless, it's an orchestral instrument. So if I move over here to the little fella here, this is a folk harp. Now, that harp is made of uh, rosewood. This harp is made of beech, but harps can be made from all sorts of timber. We'll talk about different types of timbers in a minute, and I've got a little display panel here which we'll talk about. But on here we've got beech, sycamore, utility, maple, walnut. But the actual sound of the harp is not determined by the wood of the exterior, but the wood of the soundboard. And in this case, it's just a piece of Western red cedar cut in a special way from the tree, and we'll go into that in a minute. But basically, soundboards can either be made from spruce, traditionally like violins, real little cellos, or uh, for guitars and sometimes harps. In our case, we make them from Western red cedar. But more of that later on. Okay. So, as I said, this harmonic curve here is determined by the types of strings. So at the treble end, the thin end here, you have thinner, lighter strings, and they're made from gut, which comes from sheep, and it's twisted and, and split and lacquered, and it, it comes in various sizes as you go down the harp, rising by two thousandths of an inch in increment. So when you get here to the wire strings, the reason we have wire is because you have to increase the length and the mass of the string, and the harp would be up here somewhere. So in order to compromise, as ever, we actually change the material. We'll talk a little bit about what string making on, but basically a hollow sound box, which is where the sound comes from, and this is a baby sister to the big one. Same principles, same string spacing, and I'd like you to hear the difference that you have when you actually use the black notes and the white notes together. So these little levers, which We'll actually get a bit closer in a minute. Change the pitch of the string by a semitone. So I'll introduce Gwyneth now. She'll come over and she'll play a little bit on the harp. And musically, you can hear what I'm saying. Right. 
now, but we'll have to bring the camera over here so there'll be a rustling and grunting sound as it comes over here. Yeah. Now these little gizmos here um, have a little can that rises and falls. I don't know if you can see any clearer than that. So there's the C. And so when Gwyneth changes key on the harp, she would either change before she was going to play something, or sometimes if you want an accidental, you can use the semitone difference in the key you're in, you can drop it. But there's a limitation because either you tune the harp in the key you're in, or you have to modify it with a needle. So it's a folk harp, so it's meant for folk music, it's not meant for orchestral and complex things. It's a great little instrument, lots of people start on, on, on the harp like this and then they stay with it or they progress to a concert harp. It's a bit like bicycles and motor cars for simplicity, not many moving parts, quite portable, not as expensive as the bigger harps. A harp like this would cost around about £3,000, whereas a big concert harp would be somewhere in the region of £14,000. So it's quite a difference and you really need to be a serious player if you want a concert harp. But that's why they're two quite different instruments, but similar sounds and you can do wonderful things on both of them. Not that a bicycle is any worse than a car, and in some situations, it will help you. Okay, so we can have, okay, we go back to the. Uh, right, we have a close up of this one now. So we, we've seen the semitones on the concert harp. Is all this clear enough for you? Response from Chris, is it clear? Hello. Hello, yes, it's sounding good to me. Yes, okay, okay. okay. carry on. Okay, so um, this harp, I, I referred to it earlier as a concert harp and actually, or a pedal harp, because it's what the, the posh word is fully chromatic in plain any key, and that's possible because it has pedals at the bottom. So if we look at the bottom of the harp now, when we shine the camera down there, you can see pedals coming down the harp. Keep going again. Sorry, it's on the stand, so it's the... Uh, it's a little... There we are. Can you see those pedals? And I, if I press a pedal, you see it going up and down. And there are seven pedals, three on this side and four on that side. That makes seven in all, so you've got all the notes of the octave. The F, G, A, B, C, D. So you, you can actually change the pitch by pressing a pedal. But the interesting thing is, the pedal goes flat in this position, natural in that position, and sharp in that position. So effectively, 
When you're playing a harp, you've got the treble and the bass to think about with your fingers, and 21 possible positions for the pedals at the bottom. So it's quite a complex instrument. I watch from here, and when I shine in the light, you can see I, this harp I made about maybe 40 years ago. And it's come in for some rebuilding and to repurpose, and it's going fine, it's great. It probably will last me as most of the instruments should. But some of the gilding at the bottom, some of it is oil gilding, which is a satin finish, and some of it, like the feet at the bottom, is bright gilding. And later on, we'll just look at some little bits and pieces about gilding. But traditionally, gilding on a harp is one of the nice things that you can do in terms of decoration. Okay, we we'll go back to. If we go to the top here now, at the top of the harp, I mentioned that you change the pitch of the pedals. Let's watch that C again. Can you shine it on me enough? I don't know if you can see these little discs that are rotating here. Right. That's a little a little pin, a pochette, if you like, which actually rotates and pinches the string. So this is the string in flat. First position, natural. Next position, sharp. And every C on the mechanism on 47 strings will actually change in that relationship. So I'm going C. And underneath this plate, there are about 2,000 moving parts which actually sharpen and flatten the strings, which is the sort of engine of a concert harp. And unless when you modulate, when you change key, all those parts are accurately made, it will actually begin to go to tune, which is a bit of a nightmare for a harpist. So um, part of making harps is precision engineering as well as woodwork and acoustics. So we'll talk about that a bit later. But the principles are on a concert harp or a pedal harp, we change the pitch quite easily with the pedals. On a folk harp, you have to do each one individually. individually. So that's one of the Versus the minus here. Okay, we'll go back to the next. Right, put it on, on the same line. Right, so if we just position it so you can see what I'm, yeah, not bad enough, but further towards your left. That's there, okay. Um, one of the interesting things about a harp is why it's got a bendy top. It is a triangle, to be fair, which is the strongest sort of. Uh, form in a way, and it's held together with this massive tension that I talked about earlier. But as I've said before, by the time you get here, the gut strings are beginning to lose their resonance. They're a bit dumpy sounding, and unless you go up, uh, steel string, there's your gut string, and a harpist will accommodate how she plucks the string to get some kind of uniformity there. Um, but it's quite an art to actually play this harmonic curve and get the strings right. Um, so the harmonic curve changes slightly on the folk harp because it's a different stringing and it's a different, but it's the same principle of time. But in order to find out how a string works best, at what tension um, and, and what material, there's a lovely law called Mersenne's law, which is a, a, a law for looking at the tension and mass and speaking length of the string and material. All materials, sound materials, have different properties. So it's an amalgam of all those different things that you actually end up with the time on the curve. And many years ago, a big French company put all this formula into a computer to look at how accurate all this was. And they put it, overlaid it over a, a harp made in 1850, and it was almost the same shape. So they empirically arrived at what the computers um, verified with all their calculations. So. The most important thing here is you're actually making a musical instrument, and the most important thing is that that instrument should be easy to play and responsive and actually be what music is good at, which is making this wonderful sound. And as an instrument, it, it, it should kind of draw you towards playing it because it is so responsive. So part of getting all these tensions and this the bendy bit or the posh and the harmonic curve has to be right. So you spend a lot of time in drawing and making a harp to get those proportions right. Okay, we'll perhaps move over a bit now to some of the specific um, processes in making a harp, if you like. And earlier, <coughs> we, 
earlier we talked about um, the different processes in making a harp. So I mentioned the pedal just now. So we'll just look at how you'd actually make a pedal. Just a brief look at it. Um, first of all, if you're going to make a pedal, you have to make a pattern. If you want to cast it in grass, which we do. So there's a pattern. This one is actually made in, in uh, polyester, but I did make a wooden pattern. And then because I wanted many of this shape, this became the mother pattern. And then I, I cast them in this little tub here. And I put the molten uh, material in here and swung it around my head on a piece of string. So the centrifugal force forced it into all the crevices. And when it dried, out popped a perfect little plastic pedal, which I used for my pattern to make the heart. Uh, then we put it in a furnace <coughs> and melted the brass. And here's here's the mold which which was in sand. And here we are pouring the molten copper and zinc, which makes up brass, into the mold. Now you can see some white smoginess coming off here. And I happen to be casting this uh, in the valleys. And a delegation of women came up and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm casting brass. And they said, what's all this white smoke? And I said, well, I can't help it because the zinc is more volatile than, than the copper. And the smoke comes off before it all melts. Or well, they said, we don't want you doing that, but don't do it on a Monday because that's washing day. So any day other than a Monday. So that's pouring the, um, the local metal. This is lifting the molten metal out of the furnace. Let's get that for the light here, that's better. Um, so at about 860 here, we're lifting the metal out. And I had an old fellow who was a retired fellow, because a lot of these skills have been lost. And he actually put a milk bottle in the top of the melt. And he said, what that milk bottle does, the glass melts at a low temperature, but it picks up all the impurities of, of, of the brass and brings them to the top of the skin. And just before you pour, you wipe off that molten glass and then you pour and you don't get any infusion, which is quite a good tip, except that I was worried about the milk marketing board catching up and making nothing milk bottle. Right, so then out of the sand come three pebbles. There we are. Now these are just, I didn't polish any of them up, but you can see there's the header there to give pressure and the molten brass then ran out and formed the brass. So that's one of the processes. Another process is tool making. Now, here's a little plane that I made many years ago. It's a, a rebate plane. And in those days, you had to dovetail the sides to the bottom in metal. You hear about dovetailing wood, but here, this one has been done, I think it's, uh, it says 1977. Now, yeah, I think it, I did it while we were on holiday for the Queen's Jubilee. So, some of the processes of making a harp means that you have to make the tools before you make the harp. Here's another fellow. This one is made in rosewood. Um, this is a stop chamfer plane, quite a specialist thing. And I think quite often it's quite a good thing. The actual tool should be a work of art as well as the job that they do. So the chap who taught me, if we're here, here. This is John Thomas. Uh, affectionately known as the old badger, who taught me how to make harps all those years ago. And I'm so grateful to him. And it's one of the reasons I try to continue to pass on skills because unless we do, we lose them. So he's working on a chromatic harp there for Belgium. Not with a mechanism, but with cross strum strings, which is another different type. And we used to make them for children so they could start learning and we wouldn't lose that particular type of play. <coughs> Then there's the mechanism, and in my hand here, as you can see, here's some of the little components that you have to make by turning and milling. There's one made in an aircraft alloy because some of the materials we use are quite exotic. This is in a this is a 7,000 series aircraft alloy which flies above you in the airplane. This is brass again, which has been machined, and there are 2,000 different sorts of parts in a mechanism. So. So that's there's another example of casting. There's a, a rib for the inside of the sound box, casting wood. So first of all, you have to be a pattern maker, and then there's the outcome aluminium. And when you measure the parts, 
for, for making patterns, the ruler is not a standard size because you have to allow, if it was say 300 mil between centers, the ruler measures 305, say, because when the metal shrinks, it closes down to the right diameter. Right, so I think it might be a bit of fun to look at some of the processes on a half. Now, I think we need to wander over to this one, which I forgot to show you in there. We'll, we'll look at some, there are some different disciplines in decoration for a half. So we'll go over to the concept half and look at some decorative stuff. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's an inlay of flowers in the harmonic curve. There we are. So there are petals and leaves and stems there, let into the top of the heart. And you can see the gold leaf on the side there. But if, when it goes down, you actually see a decoration on the soundboard now. And this is a lovely example of all the different skills involved in hat making because you can be painting soundboards or inlay. And the, the actual um, cover of the soundboard is a traditional recipe from 17th century by Senim of Senim, where you put linseed oil and water together and a chicken's egg as a, as a, a notifier between the oil and the water, which wouldn't ordinarily mix. And you put it in the sun and the ultraviolet light works on the outer, outer, in, in the egg um, and it actually makes it a lovely soft colour um, and then you can paint on it. This one's paint with, I think, um, burnt sienna. Um, and we, I will show you some more designs now. But the great thing about a harp is the sky's the limit. You don't have to follow tradition as you would have to if you're making violin. So I quite like that. Here's another design um, on the wall here, as you can see there. Now these are harebells, which actually go on the church wall with us. So you go along, you take your sketch pad, your ink block, and, and, and then you can actually paint them on a harp. Okay? So here's the harp, there's the basic design, and here's the harp with the decoration on. That's the made in maple. So I'm getting a bit more adventurous now. I'm starting to use color because I've never done this stuff. And then sometimes you're asked to carve on a harp. So here at the top here, there's some designs. I don't know if you can see some carved work oak leaves and ink bones. And over here, I can just make out can you see that little snail. Yeah, that little snail. And the lady wanted me to carve a column like a snake, and it didn't really work. So I said, Well, I'll do it. I'm so slow, I'll do a snail. But even then you have to work out. Does the snail shell go clockwise or anti-clockwise? It teaches you to learn and look. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think that's all for the decoration, uh, except for the inlay. So I was going to show you how a little bit how that's done. So first of all, I don't know if you can see this board here. Yeah. You saw the flowers. Well, I've just done a few more just to show you. And to show you how it's done, here's a little punch, which is the same shape as those leaves. Yeah. And I punch the shape out of some maple. There we are. You can see the leaf shape being cut out. And then there's another little punch, which is the shape of the petals. I'm not sure how easy it is for you to see that. And I punch the petal shapes out. <coughs> and then in order to get a sense of 3D, I char the edges with hot sand. You dip the little petals in hot sand and it burns to give you, for instance, I don't know if you can see on the, on the leaves here, it looks like there's a bit of veining in there and that's basically charring the edge of the wood. So what I'll do now, I'll throw a little bit of French polish on that and it'll suddenly jump the light. Now there it is, okay, so it's just plain wood, and now, there we are. See it come to light? And it's past. So that's a little bit of decoration, and I think we're, we're about 
How are we doing for time, Chris? Mute myself. Hello. Hello. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, you're, you're getting up to half an hour. Um, okay. are, are you, how are you feeling? Are you fine? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. I just wonder if we just better do the music. I could do a little bit of gilding or just do the music. What do you want to do? Or both? Sure. Can we have a show of hands? Gilding or music next? Or both. <laughs> gilding. Thumbs up for gilding. Yeah, that's a good few. Thumbs up for a piece of music. Yeah, it's about 50 50. Do it both, Al. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. On, only briefly, then. Um, the, the traditional way for gilding was to have a thing called a um, loose leaf, which is gold leaf, which is two tenths of a thousandth of an inch thick. It just floated off there. Right? I know. All right. <laughs> so you have to actually make a special preparation on the wood with gold and, uh, and gesso and make it up. And it was a long, complex, difficult process. And nowadays, there's a new process where if you want gilding, which is just right. sort of a mat gilding like this, you just put a size on there, like a sticky paint without the pigment, and then you put the leaf on. But also, um, Here's a piece of gold leaf here from a transfer leaf, and I just coated this little molding here, ready for the leaf. <laughs> it's very light. I mean, two tenths of a thousandth of an inch, that's about as thick as Matt's toilet paper. Right, so I'll put that on there. Now it may not stick because I was a bit late doing this. I'm rubbing it with a special cloth there. Yeah. And can you see how bright that is? What is this stuff? It's like a silken handkerchief, actually. So I put it on now, and if I rub it slightly now, there's that lovely bright gloss. Which would have taken days and days to do before. It's not quite clear at the moment, but that's a process that gives you a really bright finish. And that's new technology. That's people producing stuff in a little bottle here, which actually, um, there's, a, there's a Russian saying, if you're going to do something, if you're going to scratch your ear, you don't do that, you do this, don't you? And the idea behind it is to make complicated things simpler so that you've got the joy of whatever it is without too much work. So that's gilding. A very quick introductory, I'm sorry, but at least it gives you an idea. Um, and then we'll do a bit of music and then you open the last question. Okay? Not bad, I mentioned um, Western Red Cedar before because this guitar is made from Western Red Cedar. The back and sides are made from an old headboard. A lady in chapel said she had a bit of mahogany and gave it to me, and it turned out to be a nice piece, so that's how this came about. So, uh, when it's going to play, well, we're going to do something called Rigoletto. Rigoletto, which is a kind of South American little thing just for a bit of fun for me. Yeah. Okay.
Hello. Let me introduce myself. tools with a mission, which is getting sewing machines and tools out to people in Africa so that they've got the tools for self-reliance. And uh, if you're interested, just go on their website, TWAN, um, and if you've got any old tools, any old sewing machines, you can take it to them. I work there sometimes while I'm in Cardiff, refurbish the tools for the oil. It's a great cause because without the tools, we can't make the machines and we can't make the instruments. And the most important thing about instrument making is it makes music. Okay. Coming. They're coming. Hello. 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 Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Alan. That was great. That was fabulous and great to have a bit of music. I it made my speakers rattle a little. I just had to turn my volume down a bit because the frequency was a bit wild for my poor laptop. That was great. How do you feel? Okay. 